it's tight, but we're in the lead. It appears working people may have prevailed in this fight. After trailing by 2,000 votes on election night, Seattle City Council member Shama Sawant looks like she's survived a historic recall effort. As mayor, I will say the problem does stop with me. The buck stops with me. Former council president Bruce Harrell is set to become Seattle's next mayor as the city tackles a COVID pandemic, an economic recovery, and a homelessness crisis. Protect us, you know, just help us do something. If it doesn't improve very quickly, we will close. As 2021 wraps up, what were some of the biggest headlines? Well, first takeaway is the, the ground game matters. Get the scoop with our panel of veteran reporters. We have huge changes happening in our public safety and incarceration approach. It's, you know, homeless political theater. Looking back on the year's top stories, next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. 2021 marks a historic year for Seattle, with our first ever recall election involving a city council member, the first woman ever elected city attorney, and the first Asian American ever elected mayor. But even as a new chapter begins for Seattle, some history appears to be repeating itself. Concerns about public safety and homelessness, as well as a power struggle brewing inside City Hall, are familiar storylines from 2021 that will continue well into the new year and beyond. 2021 will likely be a year Michael Creel wants to forget. If it doesn't improve very quickly, we will close. Outside the restaurant he owns with his wife, Yong Hong Wong, the Seven Stars Pepper Szechuan at 12th and Jackson in Little Saigon, there's an open air market of drugs and stolen goods that's been getting more and more brazen and dangerous. We pay the tax. I try to them to protect us, you know, just help us do something. Wong wipes away tears as she describes how lawless the area around her restaurant has become. All the homeless people around here, you know, just like a drug, sometimes they sleep in there, they drug there. And how frustrating it is to see city leaders not responding with urgency. They're not doing anything thus far. Uh, we're hoping it'll change with the incoming administration. That incoming administration features Seattle's first elected mayor of Asian heritage, Bruce Harrell, who's pledged to keep the city's public spaces clear of encampments and to reduce crime. I don't make excuses. And as mayor, I will say the problem does stop with me. The buck stops with me. He joins a slate of moderates to assume city leadership in 2021, including the first woman ever to hold the city attorney's job, Ann Davison, who's promising an increase in criminal prosecutions once she's on the job. The role of our city attorney is to make sure that we are dealing with what our society's limits are to protect them. So the prosecution has to be there. Add to that another moderate voice on city council in citywide position nine, Sarah Nelson, who's pushed back on the idea of defunding the police with the SPD losing about 350 officers in the past year and a half. We need to bring our staffing back up and have a plan for seriously dealing with crime, responding to it seriously. But the shift to a more moderate Seattle did not include City Council position three. I think it looks promising to us. After a strong showing on election night, the first ever recall election of a Seattle City Council member appeared headed to failure as Shama Sawant's socialist alternative movement turned the tide against the vote to remove her. It appears working people may have prevailed in this fight. Meanwhile, the fight to end homelessness took another turn in 2021 with the hiring of a new CEO for the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. Mm -hmm. I think that this community has the resources and the will to get this done. We just needed the vehicle, and I think the authority can be that vehicle. Mark Dones is promising change in the new year, a theme echoed by other Seattle area leaders. If we don't fight, we will never win. Yeah. Council member Sawant is promising to push for rent control. The new mayor, city attorney, and position nine council member are pushing to get tougher on crime. After a year of historical firsts on the ballot, business owners like Michael Creel and Yong Hong Wong 
say it's time for Seattle to focus on its future. I went to so many countries. I never see any country like this, the drug on the street. You hear a lot of promises, but you don't see any action. And we have a group of journalists to talk a little bit more about these stories, including Kevin Schofield of Seattle City Council Insight. We have Amy Radel. She is a reporter at KUOW. And finally, Essex Porter, just retired a few weeks ago after 39 years as a senior political reporter at Cairo TV. It's great to have you all in Essex. Thanks for making extra time. Retired guy. We're going to have to learn a little bit more about what's happening with you in a little bit. And let me start with you, Essex, if I could. Talking about one of the most recent big headlines in Seattle, what appears to be a failed attempt to recall Council Member Shama Sawant. You live in District 3, where this vote happened, and this was a highly charged election, about a million dollars raised for each campaign in a district of 75,000 people. So what were your main takeaways from this special election, the first ever involving a city council member in Seattle? Well, first takeaway is the, the ground game matters. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having lived in this district and knowing that uh, Shama Sawant has been elected a few times, I've, I've been through those campaigns. Uh, I happen to live on sort of an obscure little portion of the district. Uh, and the Sawant campaign over the years has been the only campaign that has consistently doorbelled my house. Mm. And uh, they doorbelled my house twice. They are polite. They are persistent. But they are relentless. And uh, that ground game, uh, that ability to put together a relentless campaign uh, is is what uh, salvaged her seat because it's a very, very close race. So, uh, you know, even a couple of votes here are going to matter. Yeah. yeah, we'll see what happens with these uh, votes that they're trying to cure right now, as it's been said. And Amy, let me go to you here because opponents have tried and failed a number of times to unseat Council Member Sawant. She is now the longest serving member on the Seattle City Council. So mm -hmm. District 3 voters did not support removing her from office, but it was a very close race, as Essex mentioned there. Do you think this impacts her keeping her seat in 2023 if she decides to run again? Your thoughts about this? Um, well, you know, she uh, if she uh, she'll she'll feel strong. I think she she has a chance now if she prevails to you know kind of continue her work on the city council. So who knows what uh, what kinds of issues will be the most prominent in 2023? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, people have pointed out that um, sometimes her victories have narrowed. I mean, this is maybe an extremely narrow victory, but um, at the same time, you know, she represents a young progressive district um, yep. that is, as Essex said, coming through for her. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Kevin, just going to you on this one here on election night, the recall campaign did have a solid lead, but it started to melt away in the days afterwards. And just playing off what Amy was saying there, you've broken down some of the numbers on this election. It really looks like the age of the voters was a determining factor here yet again. Um, I, I think I disagree a little bit with with Amy in that it's a very deeply divided district in a lot of ways. Or when you look at the age demographics of it, uh, in terms of you know voters, there's uh, there are about 30,000 voters who are uh, uh, less than age 35. There's about 30,000 voters who are 55 or older. And then there's about, uh, you know, there, there's a group uh, in the middle, about 15, 16,000 in, in the middle. And the younger group is solidly progressive, as you know, Amy and Essex, Essex have mentioned, uh, but they don't reliably vote. The older voters, about 55, uh, are much more moderate, and they very reliably vote. They were about 72% of them voted, right? What Sawan is bet on here mm -hmm. is that uh, the the large, young, progressive voters, she believes over time she can get more and more of them to show up. If she'd gotten right. them to show up, you know, a, as much as the older ones had, she would have won this, this election by a landslide. Because those early votes that came in, those were the older voters, basically, right, Kevin? I, I know right. we talked is, about this. This is what we tend before. to see across the whole city, including in District Three, yeah. that um, older, more moderate voters tend to vote early, re return their ballots either through drop boxes or mail in early, and the younger, more progressive voters tend to vote on election day. Right. Right. Uh, just, Amy, back to you again. And I just want to talk a little bit more about election news and looking back at November here. Voters elected three more moderate candidates here, talking about Bruce Harrell for mayor, Sarah Nelson for citywide council position nine, and then Ann Davison for city attorney. What impact do you think this ideological shift, if you want to call it that, in these positions will have on city policies? I know we've already heard from the mayor elect pushing back on the council's police budget, for example. What do you think about the results of the November election? 
Um, I feel like the issues that seem to be prominent with these candidates that prevailed were um, talking about working to combat public disorder, um, working to hear the concerns of small businesses. Sometimes those storefront businesses are really having an impact from people in crisis on the street who don't have other places to go. Um, so I felt like that was the, um, you know, the issues. And Bruce Harrell, you know, held one of his big press conferences at Green Lake saying, you know, we're going to um, have our green space spaces back for youth recreation. We're going to find better solutions for the people who are living unsheltered in our parks. Um, but I feel like um, Councilmember Sawant's um, fighting her recall, um, that's adding to my context for how I'm going to view the, the lineup in the city going forward, because um, that's an important addition to if we all just say, oh, no, we're having kind of this law and order back to basics um, slate that was elected. Um, you know, we have to take her prevailing into that context right. where she's advocated for renter protections and, you know, people have anxieties around the kinds of issues that she's championed as well. Mm -hmm. I, she's talking about a lot. I know she's going to be talking about rent control before the end of the year. So we'll keep an eye on that. Thank you for that, Amy. Kevin, I'll go back to you on this one because you've been tracking some of the battle lines being drawn between the council and city attorney elect and Davison and Davison definitely wrote on this uh, a tough on crime platform, but now the council has been pushing her for some more pre-filing diversion programs instead of prosecutions. I wanted to talk about what's going on there, that dynamic between the council and the city attorney elect. What's going on? What we could expect to see in the future? Yeah. Uh, so uh, on the uh, election, you know, campaign uh, trail, uh, Davison made a lot of comments that uh, sounded like she was tough, wanted to be tougher on crime maybe backing away a little bit from the city councils and, and in many ways the mayors and, and previous city attorneys uh, strong commitment to both sort of pre-booking and pre-filing diversion programs. Mm -hmm. Pre-filing is when the city attorney uses their prosecutorial discretion to say we're going to send people to uh, diversion programs which is one run by this local organization called Choose 180 instead right. of Rather filing charges yeah. against them and making them go through the, the traditional uh, criminal justice system. Yeah. And uh, the city council is worried that she's going to back away from these programs that they've in fact put more money into for 2022. Mm -hmm. So they've sort of, at first they wanted to see if they can mandate it. It turns out that they can't do that because the city charter says that prosecutorial discretion is solely in the hands of the city attorney. Right. But they've added a whole bunch of additional reporting requirements and notice requirements so that they can track whether Davison uh, is actually continuing to, to follow, uh, follow through on those programs that they funded. Yeah. And what Davison is saying now is she actually supports diversion programs. Mm -hmm. We'll see in practice what that, that looks like. I think, you know, in sort of the larger scope, this raises a question about is what we saw in this election kind of a move back from sort of progressive to kind of the middle, or is it a, a question more of, are, are people questioning whether some of these programs that we've slapped progressive labels on actually work or not? Yeah, right? are they effective? We have right. a progressive label on a bunch of our homeless response programs, a lot mm -hmm. of our, you know, reform to the criminal justice system. Sure. But but are they giving them are they actually giving us the results that we want to see? Right. Because yeah. crime is up. You know, gun violence is up. Right. Um, homelessness continues to go up. Uh, taxes are up. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of frustration in folks uh, minds about, you know, whether these programs are actually working out, sure. regardless yeah. of whether they're progressive or more moderate right. or, or conservative. Right. Labor what I'm always matter. wondering yeah. about is, yeah. please, Essex, does the, the ideological makeup of the council would it have changed much if Sawat had failed in the, in the mm -hmm. recall? You know, these are council members uh, who voted together on probably 90% of whatever's happening anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and when council member Sawant votes against something, sometimes it's just because she knows she's already gotten three quarters of the loaf and she wants to make a point that she should have gotten the entire loaf. Uh, okay. So yeah, I'm not, you know, what really changes on the city council in terms of its ideological makeup and approach? It, it's a fair question. And Kevin, this is one of those deals where it's the balance of, you know, people who are labeled as more progressive versus more moderate. I, I, I still think that the progressive voice that is on the city council still has a majority when it comes to what they're going to be voting on. Oh, that that's absolutely true. Uh, yeah. You know, it's still very much progressive. And, you know, and uh, Bruce Harrell has you know said that he's, you know, progressive. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I think, you know, we have to look at which axis is going to move here. Is it the progressive yeah. versus moderate or yeah. is it picking and choosing programs more carefully that that may sort of right. transcend at some level one of those 
you know, one of those labels. Yeah. And Amy, maybe I can go back to you. When we talk about these different issues of we're going to clean streets up, we're going to keep these parks clear of encampments. Do you think these different candidates that are now candidates elect, I guess you would say, are they going to be able to come through on those promises? Um. Well, we already saw, you know, I think last week people were pretty happy with the outcomes initially at the Ballard Commons where they said, you know, we didn't, it, we didn't evict people. We didn't sweep them forcefully. We, right. you know, put in a lot of time. We really yeah. negotiated. We really tried to figure out the best fit mm-hmm. for them. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the neighborhood will be happy with this solution if it right. is, if it, if it lasts. So right. maybe there's some movement happening toward just from, from trial and error. And, you know, we're, we're making our way regardless of of who's been elected to, you know, to trying to thoughtfully make some progress on these issues. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see what shakes out there. And thank you for breaking that piece down. Uh, Kevin, I'll go back to you and sticking with the topic of homelessness here, if I could. One of the biggest local stories behind the scenes over this past year, King County hiring a CEO for the new Regional Homelessness Authority, the RHA, really begins its work in earnest next year as Seattle transfers more than $100 million of its budget to the county to support this regional effort. What have you noticed over the past year as the RHA has worked to establish itself? What do you think we can expect on this bigger issue of homelessness in relation to the RHA in 2022? Well, I I think the first thing we need to admit at this point is one year in, it's still not a regional homeless authority. It's Seattle and King County. And all, you know, no other cities have joined in, at least, you know, know, the... Sound Cities uh, coalition of smaller sort of towns and cities has been given a couple of positions on the governing board of this for the hope of enticing them to, to join in. But none of them are putting money in. None of them are really sort of making a bet on this yet. So it's still King County putting a bunch of money in, Seattle putting a bunch of money in, and then coordinating efforts that were, you know, pretty much coordinated anyway. So I think on that level, it's not really transcending what was happening before. And yet at the same time, there's already some, you know, b- bigger issues that, that we have you know, could foresee and, and were in many ways foreshadowed as they were trying to negotiate a year ago the, uh, you know, the, the, the operating agreement uh, mm-hmm. between Seattle and King County for, for the Regional Homeless Authority around issues like, you know, which best practices right. and, you know, a lot of fight from are, the outside are, are followed that. by this. Mm-hmm. The CEO, Mark Dones, um, who, by the way, was their second choice. They, you know, they actually... Uh, had a, a best candidate be selected and after several weeks of negotiating she backed out and said no i'm not going to do this and they went to the, sort of their their second choice mark on this i think we're going to see some more complex in the city council and the budget that they just showed for 2022 earmarked a bunch of money for specific organizations that they've been feeding money to for many many years and they're very very tight with and yeah. it's not at all clear that the regional Homeless Authority is going to continue having those kinds of relationships and feeding money to those organizations. Essex, I just want to go to you here because you have seen so many different efforts to deal with homelessness over your career in Seattle. King County set up a 10-year program to end homelessness back in 2005. That was not successful. The county and city of Seattle then declared a state of emergency on homelessness back in 2015. Do you think this new regional homelessness authority will have a better chance of success? Yeah, that simply remains to be seen because, because as Kevin points out, the title is regional, but the participation isn't regional. And until the participation is regional, you, you, you have far less of a chance of succeeding in Seattle. Uh, you know, all of the homeless who end up in Seattle don't start as homeless people in Seattle. Uh, they, they come here because it may be their best chance for services or their best sure. chance to find a corner where they can park the RV and pitch the tent and not be bothered for a while. But that's not necessarily where they all start. And, you know, we, unfortunately, uh, there are, you know, many different causes of homelessness. Mental health is a piece, not the entire piece, but our, our society has not been good at making sure that people who need help with mental health get it. Uh, we, you know, defunded it a lot uh, say, in the Great the Recession. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, we're still paying the price for the things uh, that we didn't do properly a decade ago, which is why homelessness didn't end in a decade. Right. I would have felt a lot more. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Amy, please. No, please, Amy, go ahead. I, just, I, I would be feeling excited right now if we had found a way to go forward with the big 150 bed high acuity 
uh, facility that the authority actually has proposed for Seattle because we keep hearing about people in such severe crisis and there's nowhere to place them. Right. And so I am disappointed that, um, you know, they said, let's focus on downtown Seattle because mm -hmm. that's where people end right. up. And, uh, you know, if we could if we could work towards that, I think people would feel like, OK, there's, you know, a light on the horizon. Right. Yeah. The city of Seattle didn't put the money that the RHA was asking for into its budget. Kevin, do you have a piece on this? Yeah, I, I, to me, the big elephant in the middle of the room that nobody's talking about is uh, is we've never figured out how to scale up any of these programs to, to the scale of the problem that we're facing. We have, you know, 11, 12, maybe more thousand people in King County who are homeless. And, you know, probably at least half of that is are in the city of Seattle right now. The Ballard Commons, you know, encampment cleanup last week was a really interesting thing and it took weeks to happen. And, but in a lot of ways, it's, you know, homeless political theater, right? Because there's no way they can scale that up to the thousands of homeless people in, in this city because right. we have a lack of affordable housing. Yeah. All of our shelters are full and this whole pipeline is backed up yeah. and it's not going anywhere. Yeah. And the mental health services, as Essex and Amy have mentioned, are a part of this too. We are yeah. nowhere near the scale in, in King County and in Seattle that we need yeah. to address the need that we have. Amy, I wanted to talk about maybe another story beyond some of these bigger headlines we've talked about with the elections, with the homelessness issues here. Uh, maybe one of those headlines we have not covered here that you've been working on that's been important to you over the last 12 months? Um, yeah, I've, I've worked a lot to cover. Um, we have huge changes happening in our <clears throat> public safety and incarceration approach. And uh, so we had, you know, the uh, the Supreme Court throwing out the, our drug possession felony. And then we also had a whole set of new policing laws that took effect in July. So this is really very new. Um, and uh, so we're kind of waiting to see how those play out. Um, we've, you know, put in new restrictions on um, police use of force and decertifying police police officers for using force and things like that and uh, I just uh, for people who feel like change isn't happening quickly enough whatever their perspective I just you know I've been thinking about how we are a really interesting laboratory right now um, around policing around the diversion programs that Kevin mentioned you know we are really trying to rethink uh, some of these approaches that have been going on for decades so that's something that I covered a lot this year that's definitely going to be you know top of mind um, in the next year or two, watching how these play out, if there's, you know, changes made to to weaken them or strengthen them or go farther. So. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you've covered this happened. more closely than, than I've been able to in the last few months, but I, 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 I keep thinking about what changes need to happen in the Seattle Police Guild contract to actually implement and go further with some of these changes. What do you think? Ooh, that's a that's a great one. Any thoughts on that, Amy? Well, there's, I mean, we're just, we're always looking at the discipline system, right? Because people are saying, you know, whatever you put in place, if there's no consequences, I mean, they even just, you know, the IG just put out this report saying that some, an officer is accused of working overtime while they were supposed to be serving a suspension, you know? So uh, until you have effective consequences kind of at the back end, that's one thing that I think is always very much part of the contract negotiations, right? And then also, um, you know, they, the disciplinary organizations say we need subpoena power and things like like that we're going to have a new mayor and a new presumably a new chief of police uh, in this next year so that'll be interesting yeah. to see what kinds of strides they make on that boy that that is going to be very interesting to watch thank you for that amy i know you have a lot of work in the year ahead and i want to try to move ahead to some other issues here uh in terms of the future and kevin i'll start with you not sure what you're doing in a few weeks i'm not sure that you know either if you haven't heard folks kevin is ending seattle city council insight after a six-year run wrapping it up at the end of the year i do a podcast with kevin too my friend it has been incredible to work with you on a miss it a lot you have totally raised the bar when it comes to local government reporting i wanted to get some final thoughts from you about lessons you learned during your time covering the council and maybe a little bit more about what that experience has meant to you first of all thanks for the kind words uh, it's been an incredible learning experience for me uh, over the last uh, six years to to just watch the council and the mayor and city attorney and the relationship between those different elected officials uh, as they as they struggle with policy issues, as they struggle with, uh, you know, the, these big problems, COVID and then the, you know, racial reckoning that started with the George, George Floyd uh, have really magnified a lot of those and and exposed a lot of the flaws in the, you know, the, the Seattle process, as, as we always sort of. Yeah you know, tend to refer to our, our local political, you know, talk it out at great length political process here. Right. 
And, you know, it, it to me, I've just learned a lot about sort of what that, the, what that process looks like and the sausage making that goes behind it. Mm. You know, I, I think we, we have, I think in, in a lot of ways, you know, the parts of the, the car engine are now laid out all over the garage floor mm. and we have to try to figure out how to assemble back together in something that that's works. Right. And that, that's, that's going right. to be a big challenge, you know, just yes. bouncing off, you know, what Amy and Essex were talking about, yeah. the consent decree, the SPD consent decree right. from 2012, yeah. really fell apart in the last year and a half, right? And while, I, you know, two years ago, we were we looked like we were about to get out from under it. Now there's really no effort, no serious effort at the moment to figure out an exit mm-hmm. strategy from the consent decree. Wow. They're tr- and, and largely, you know, it's failed. And you look at things like the yeah. police accountability system. Sure. And, you know, all three legs of that three-legged stool, like community police commission, the you know office of police accountability, the office of yeah. inspector general for public safety, all look like they're really stumbling right now. So, you know, just watching that process has been very educational for me. Yeah. And carrying Thank the you. car engine analogy a little further, that was, you yeah. know, do we need to reassemble the internal combustion engine or is mm. it time to figure out how to make it an electric engine for your car? Oh, look where you, look at I you. I like that. I like that. I like that. And I did mean to bury the lead here, but Essex Porter is leaving the news business too. 43 years in broadcasting, 39 of them here in Seattle. Essex, you have been a champion of fair and straightforward reporting. Thank you very much for that. Seattle is going to miss you immensely. You know that. I wanted to ask what your big story is going to be in 2022. What's next for you? You're going to write a memoir? Are you going to counsel young Seattle reporters on how to stay dry during live shots in November? Or what do you got going on? You know, uh, you know. first, I'm trying to reassemble my personal life. Uh, you know, uh, when you retire, you need to do some downsizing, figure out what's, what's going on there. Um, and, you know, I, I'm I'm definitely retiring from the the daily news, uh, as Amy and Kevin know. It's really really tough, mm. um, but you know I, I'm still a very curious person. You know I, I still may have things to do uh, in journalism that uh, don't require uh, so much intense focus all the time. I, but the big headline I am watching for, the big thing I'm paying attention to, frankly, is the fate of American democracy. Mm. You know when we look across uh, the country and uh, see what's happening with the January 6th commission, the insurrection, and knowing what's happening even here on the local level. You know, remember, we had six police officers go to that insurrection rally. Two of them were disciplined for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also, uh, this fight over the voter integrity and elections and voter Mm -hmm. suppression, I'm looking for that to show up in the congressional elections here uh, you know, it's already showed up in the fifth district uh, congressional election, third district congressional election. The right. candidates there are constantly talking about it in the eighth district, uh, you know, which, which is, you know, right uh, next to us here uh, in the Seattle area. Uh, you know, there are candidates uh, who, you know, I'll be looking to see uh, if they truly believe that Joe Biden is the legitimately elected president of the United States and where they want to go from there. That's a tough thing uh, if you're trying to win a Republican primary. So I'm watching for that. All right. Essex, stay curious. Thank you very much for all you've done in terms of the news work in the city of Seattle here. Kevin, thank you for your work, too. And Amy, I know we're going to be in touch. So stay tuned, everybody here. Thanks very much. And we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the 2021 elections? One writes, Pushing for defunding the police or radical changes in laws is a very good way to lose elections. Another comments, watching a slate of pro-business, moderate Dems, and a Republican win in Seattle municipal elections is gutting. Transformational change will not come from our institutions. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching our show all this year. We look forward to seeing you back in 2022 when we bring you a preview of the upcoming legislative session in Olympia. That's all on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us. Happy holidays.